How's it going everybody, Mitch here. In today's video, I wanna share with you a conversation that I had with your corner man and operations director, David Sanchez. David is responsible for dispatching and managing over 34,000 jobs a year. Um, and so he's got incredible insight into federal and state guidelines, DOT guidelines. Um, and in this video, he really shares some, some interesting points about being an interstate and intrastate mover, how those two can get swapped between one another depending on your load, your capacity, the time that you're driving. Some really good information here that he stays up to date with so that you don't have to and we can share this information uh, with this community. So I hope that you guys really dig this video. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to leave them in the comment section or DM me. Uh, I'll be more than glad to, to take a look at it and get you the answer and make sure that we can share that with the rest of the community. So here you go. Let's go ahead and dive right into our conversation with David Sanchez. Um, interstate versus intrastate is one. Um, let me move this back a little bit. The interstate versus interstate is one. Um, DQ binders, which are driver qualification binders, are two. And um, let's see what the other one was. And uh, the 14 slash 15 hour rule. Um, I think that those three things affect all moving companies um, in the nation because those are federal regulations and not just state regulations. Um, and they're things that are really just looked over um, a lot of the times. Um, but the, the interstate versus the intrastate rule is um, there are two different types of, of travel. There's intrastate, which is only inside your state and then there's interstate which is you traveling across state lines usually um this gets looked over upon because people only think about it oh i'm not traveling you know across state lines so i'm i'm uh i'm doing interstate travel you know they get pulled over by a dot officer and the first thing they're going to ask you is you know are you um where are you going you know First thing they're gonna ask you. And if you tell them, like for Florida, if you tell them you're going to Georgia, um, you're like, oh, I'm in, uh, what's what's up there, Tallahassee? Tallahassee, yeah. Yeah, so if they're in Tallahassee and, they, and they're just going across, uh, across state lines to Georgia, um, you tell them, oh, I'm just going to Georgia. And this is a class C driver's license, um, you know, non-CDL, 26 foot box, 24 to 26 foot box truck. You're under, 26,000 pounds um, of weight, you know, everything checks out, right? You're, but you're just going across state lines. You are, and you are by definition, an interstate mover at that point, meaning you are now regulated by uh, DOT. You are now under, you are subject to the DOT regulations. Um, What's and those, the difference that, there? So for intrastate, um, for interstate, okay, so the difference are you don't have to log your hours and you don't have to have a driver qualifications binder. Um, there's a lot of like other smaller pieces to that, but the bigger, like all of these tie in together, interstate versus interstate, the 12 to 15 hour rule and the DQ binders, they all tie into like this one big understanding of what this mover is actually doing. Okay. So in order to qualify as an intrastate mover, uh, there are there are three I think there, there are three um, criteria that that mover needs to meet exemptions they are not traveling further than 150 mile air radius in one day so that means 150 air miles are not you know crossing that um, they are back to their and this rule the second rule the 12 the 14 15 hour rule just changed um, they are back uh, they start their day at 7 a.m. and they're back within 14 hours um, of, of when they started. Um, then the third rule is um, they're just, they're underweight the whole time, you know, under 26,001 pounds. If you meet that criteria, you are, uh, you, you are exempt from, from uh, 
DOT regulations. So if an officer pulls you over and you're you're going from Tallahassee to what's another city close to there? Like Pensacola. Pensacola. You're just going to Pensacola. Um, you left. You started your day. You started the truck at 7 a.m. You're on your way back. You're an hour away from your uh, from your home base in Tallahassee, um, and it is 6 p.m. Was that? That's 11 hours. Um, you're not that, that DOT officer cannot do anything to you because you're you're not subject to the DOT regulations. You're exempt from them. That's pretty much the main difference. Once you cross over into interstate travel, you now have to log your hours, meaning uh, so you are traveling further than 150 air mile radius, you're working longer than a 14 hour day, um, and you are over 26,000 um, and one pounds. Uh, and you're I'm leaving, sorry, you you're leaving line, Florida, you're leaving Florida into Georgia. Now this is where the DOT interstate begins. Interstate. Yes. So you're leaving Florida into, into um, Georgia, into Georgia. Yeah. Um, and it's not always like that. If you're, if you're heavier than 26,001 pounds, even inside the state and you, and you, you're just doing, you know, a, a delivery or something, you're going to be back within, you know, five or six hours and you're going 20 miles up the road, but you're actually at 22,000 or yeah, uh, not 27,000 pounds. You're, you're subject to DOT regulations. You're overweight. So either you need a CDL driver out there um, running that truck, or you need to have another truck come out and unload into that truck to, to even out the weight. But that, it can get kind of hairy with that. Um, but just to, just to clear things up, once you become an interstate tra uh, interstate mover, you need a driver qualifications binder, um, which means there. Um, whenever you onboard a driver, you have to do certain. Uh, there's a certain process you have to follow. You have to do uh, like a background check. You have to do an MBR report. You have to do a road test. You have to make sure they have a medical card. Um, there's a lot of things that go into a DQ binder, but they need to have that. Because if you get audited and they look at your bill of lading or your contract and they see that you started to move in Tallahassee and you went to Georgia and, and the move ended in Georgia, right? Well, that is a interstate service. Who was on that move that day? Show me their hours. You know, um, all of those that show me their driver binder, their uh, driver qualifications binder. They will look at all that. And a lot of the, the smaller moving companies and even some of the larger ones don't really understand that distinction of like, no, we're, we just we are just inside. We don't even cross state lines. Uh, we're just inside uh, our state it's the state of Florida. Well, if you go from Miami to Orlando, you know. You are an interstate mover at that point because you're you meet the criteria of an interstate mover 150 air mile radius uh and they also oh, right off the, the bat that one of those things you're either overweight you're over the 150 miles you're uh what, what you cross state lines anything like that boom you're now you're now uh you're now you've now qualified as an interstate mover meaning or interstate mover and you now fall under dot federal regulations correct yes wow. yeah so um yeah it's a it's a little bit a little bit tricky on that one um but yeah that that's pretty much the gist of of what an interstate mover versus intrastate mover so like i said if you ever if a mover ever gets pulled over the first thing they're going to ask you is where you're going because they're trying to figure out are you doing intrastate or are you doing interstate and if uh, the driver doesn't fully understand the question, he could he could technically be an intrastate mover, but be because the driver doesn't really know the distinction, it gives the gives the wrong information to the DOT officer, and then now is subject to the roadside inspection and all those other things that they'll do right on site. So it's very important that. Uh, as movers, you you understand that yes, you are a moving company. You provide moving services, but you're technically, by classification, a trucking company, and you need to make sure that your trucking company paperwork is all sorted out as well. So you have two. Not only do you have 
like here in Texas, we have Texas DMV regulations for, for movers. But we also have to follow the FMCSA uh, regulations for our trucking company. There's two things we got to worry about there. And we got to make sure that they mesh well. So that means our, our moving bill of lading meshes well with our FMCSA uh, regu regulations. So a good, uh, a good thing to practice is that uh, whenever, you on, whenever you hire a driver, whenever you onboard somebody, it's a good thing to always just do a driver qualifications binder with them. Um, do it all off the bat, train them how to log their hours, train them, uh, help them understand what an interstate versus interstate is. And um, that way you don't really have to worry about it. Sure. You know, if all of your guys, like we do here, all of my guys have driver qualification binders. So it doesn't matter who I send long distance to, you know, San Antonio from Houston, three hour drive. It's what, 200 miles. It's, it meets the criteria. They're good. Right. They're good. They know that I'm going long distance. All I need to do today is log my hours and then log them for the next seven days after. And I'm good. So that's, um, that's that, that's pretty much the interstate versus interstate. It's a very good, uh, um, business practice just to just to create a binder make it part of and if you have your own like company uh, application or onboarding process keep in mind the driver qualifications binder that's its own binder All you cannot company, mix the two you can i mean you there's you can't but if you ever get audited what's going to happen is um in anything in anything in life you never want to give the auditor more than what they ask for only give them what they ask for so if they're only going to ask for the dq binder stuff only give them that because if if you give them you know um some of your other paperwork and it's all not in order either they could find you on that as well wow okay and that's and that's, good. that's the goal i mean the goal is not to not to not get fined it's to to be safe you know to make sure that everybody is safe and that's why these regulations are set in place um the 12 to the i mean the the 14 and 15 hour rule, I said 12 because um, it used to be the 12 and 15 hour rule. So for class C drivers or non-CDL drivers, um, they have a fit, they, they used to, they had a 15 hour work day. 12 of those hours could be driving. The other three of those hours um, are just like on duty, not driving. Like they're cleaning up the shop or they're loading as a mover, unless you're doing like a super long distance bid, something, you know, states away, you're probably not going to meet that criteria of driving for 12 hours. That's not something you really need to worry about. In my opinion, we don't really worry about it here, but what we do worry about is um, if you are gone longer than 12 hours, you need to log your hours. So that's, that was the old rule. The new rule is you now have a 14 hour, uh, uh, 14 hour drive time, um, not drive time. You have 12 hour drive time, but you have 14 hours before you have to log your hours. So it's kind of confusing. You still have a 15 hour work day. 12 of those hours can be drive time. Um, 14 hours, you can work without having to log your hours. But if you want that extra hour, you have to log your hours. And logging your hours is something um, like a, a CDL driver will understand. But it's it's a you can buy a paper log book. It's just a little book like that, and um, you're basically just putting yourself in different statuses. So as soon as you start the truck, you put yourself on on duty, right? From at 7 a.m. you were on duty. At 7:05 a.m. you were driving, right? you drove for three hours at 10 or 5 AM you're back to on duty. You're loading up the truck. You know, you did that for four hours at two or 5 PM you're driving again. And you're just, you're basically just having a report of your hours for that day. So that way, if you get audited or get pulled over um, by a DOT officer, they under, they understand how long you've been away and what you've actually been doing um, in that, in that space span of time. So uh, it's important to log your hours. You have to have a clear understanding of your day. So if you are on hour, 
well, now it's hour 13 of, you know, a job, which is extremely long um, and is a very rare case, by the way, it, for a moving company. Uh, it doesn't, for us at least, it doesn't happen too often that we actually have a move that's going to take, you know, 14 hours. It, chances are we might split it up into two days. So it wouldn't even matter anyway. But if you ever run into this case and um, you're driving back and it's, you know, hour 14 and it's going to take you 30 minutes to get to your uh, parking station, uh, you have 14 and a half hours. Technically, you, by, by definition, you need to log your hours. So might as well just log them. So um, that's the 14 slash 15 hour rule. Um, and then the DQ binders, I already explained, it's just a, a binder that has all the documentation of that driver. Uh, and most of, it, most of it is like background information, making sure that they are qualified to, to drive the truck and okay. qualified to be employed with you, uh, but also that they are medically qualified to, to do the job. Yeah, I think uh, the, one of the biggest takeaways from this, not only the complexity, right, mm -hmm. of what you need to be managing, especially for our, our the MotoGo members, most of them are the owners of, of their company. And this is something that falls squarely on, on them to ensure that they do this. Uh, I think the, the biggest takeaway was what you said, like, don't do this. The point is not to do this, not to get fined. It's to keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And, and I think that's such an important thing is, uh, is, is to keep that front in mind, David, there's so many, um, there's so many things that we've got. I know that we're going to be talking about this regularly with and sharing it with our, our members. What, um, what's the best way for a member to, um, to get information regarding the regulations and any questions that they may have, um, is it, you know, besides we know that they can come to us and, and reach out to us. Is there any other resources that, that they should know about? Well, there are, there are a few resources. I will tell you this, the FMCSA, um, and not trying to badmouth them, but they don't really make it easy for anybody to kind of understand these rules and regulations. This is, um, this is their book. I have read at one point. This is a book about uh, the regulations. Wow. You can also uh, go to the website, fmcsa.gov, I believe. And um, at, I mean, they have like a help center. You can ask questions and it'll direct you to them. Um, as you can learn, the, the 14 and 15 hour rule just changed. Uh, I can't even tell you when it changed because I, I don't know that. Uh, but I, I, it used to be the 12, 15 hour rule. And they changed it to 14 to 15 hour rule. I'm guess I'm guessing because of COVID, um, a lot of the the regulations to uh, to help speed up delivery services and things like that to help get resources to place needed. They had to change the regulations so that the drivers could could get it to get it to okay. uh, get there. So they had to change that. So I don't know exactly when that rule changed, um, but even on their website, as I checked last week, it was still the 12 15 hour rule. Um, so those are two resources is you buy the book, which is updated quarterly, by the way. So it's updated. This book is updated four times a year. Wow. Um, yeah. And they don't tell you what updates are made. Not, not to my knowledge. <laughs> they don't tell you. What okay. are made. Um, and, uh, their website would be the two biggest ones. Um, I have, I have done seminars where I go and they kind of run you through, you know, a trucking company it's not catered to movers if you go with the mover mindset like i'm here as a moving company um you're probably not gonna get a lot out of it you have to go with the mindset as your trucking company you're trying to understand these regulations that involve trucking companies because by definition you are one um and uh yeah the i just had to go to a bunch of seminars and read that book and you know kind of do a lot of background information to make sure i'm getting it right and even to this day um, I, I'm well versed in it, but I would not call myself a true expert until I'm able to like exactly teach a class, I would say. Um, uh, but I, uh, I do know quite a bit about them because of, you know, my, I read the book and I visit the websites and, um, and did the, uh, 
I guess the the courses, but um, but I think that's learning- a, that that that's a huge um, benefit. I think for the members that are watching this, and if there's anybody else that's that that ends up seeing this video, um, is is be, by being a member of MotoGo and and being a member of MotoGo Nation. Um, they don't need to technically go through all of that. They have a resource they can tap into with you to kind of guide them and and give them your understanding and your perspective of it um, to hopefully help them and guide them and, and, and answer some questions for them and, and, you know, direct them to the right place if if it's something that we can't help them with. But that's a, that's a huge, a huge place um, for them to start is that they can come right here and, and, and tap into this resource that we're, that we're, uh, we're there for them. And that's kind of your role as the corner man for them. I think it's a, it's a big help. It goes far beyond just dispatching orders. It's helping them with that, this part of their business. So, yeah, this, this part is the most um, ambiguous because of the, uh, uh, again, uh, I would just say lack of resources. Fortunately, I have been very fortunate and I have uh, made some friends with some, some people with the Texas TA and the AMSA um, who help write these regulations so if i don't know an answer or if i'm wrong you know they will definitely help me get the right answer or just flat out tell me what the right answer is and um that that really does help um but yeah the the regulations are, are not easy to understand and uh, i am always here at anybody's uh, uh disposable to to help them you know just to if you have any questions just shoot me an email send me a text um, any way you can, and I will definitely try to help you or get the answer for you. 